great fun session. Darren, we are um, in the process of recording. If we can ask everyone to um, put themselves on mute, I think everyone, Darren is kind of still letting people in. So today is going to be a really interesting session. We're going to ha talk to Kate Dodsworth from um, the the regulator, talking about the um, uh, the con the um, oh, I totally had a blank. So we are going to be um, having a discussion today and um, talking about what is coming next with the consumer standards and the. Um, uh, and the, and the timeline. And then we're gonna hear from Sarah Davis um, from CIH. And then we're gonna hear from Darren, um, our chief executive. And then we're gonna open it up for questions. So does everyone know, I'm hoping everyone knows, because I think a lot of people have already been in these sessions before that you can type in the chat, you can type your questions in the chat. I'm going to be, while I'm chairing and, and listening to everyone, looking at the questions in the chat. Um, and then, um, we can, at the end of each, uh, when, e when everyone's actually talked, then we can open it up for a discussion um, and um, we can take questions. So if you have trouble, um, just flag something up in the chat and then I can address it and Darren can as well while we're kind of moving on. So I think everyone has come in. Darren is gonna keep an eye on letting people in that come late. Um, I am now gonna hand over to Kate um, and um, she's gonna be talking for 15 minutes and kind of letting you know what's been going on and the um, talking about the tenant satisfaction measures and the timelines and everything. So welcome Kate, thank you for coming today um, to talk to um, the people in the webinar, thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and morning, everyone. It's really, really good to be here. I'm Kate, Director of Consumer Regulation at The Regulator, as Leslie said. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, proposals for us at The Regulator from the Social Housing White Paper just over a year ago and what it means for us and what it means for the sector. And then, as Leslie said, I'm more than happy to take lots of questions at the end. I have my colleague Claire Wilde here, who is here specifically to take the very difficult questions, um, and I will take the easy ones. So first of all, um, I'll do a, a, a very, very quick trot through, and I think a really good place to start on this is that publication, the Social Housing White Paper, just over a year ago. Um, and I think we all remember seeing it and thinking, well, that's a very good idea. It's been a long time coming. It's a very good idea. It was born of the horrendous tragedy of Grenfell and born, I think, of a vision of seeing a cultural shift in the social housing sector for tenants, the relationship between landlords and tenants and the quality of homes and services. And I haven't met a single person since that day that has disagreed with that as an actual vision. I think we've waited for the legislation, some of the, 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 the proposals for us, the tenant satisfaction measures, we don't need to wait for legislation for, I'll talk more about those in a moment. The rest, the revision of our consumer standards and how we get assurance against them, we still need legislation for. Just to say on that, I am hopeful that we will get it, by the way, in the first half of this year. So hopefully wait no more and then we can get on, on with that piece. But within the white paper, there was a range of proposals, not just for us, for the regulator, but as you know, the housing ombudsman to be given more powers and more teeth, which he, they have at the moment. And with the setting up of the building safety regulator within the health and safety executive. So a whole range of proposals, uh, root and branch really for the social housing sector, but primarily about this culture. 
Now, what that means specifically for us for regulation, we already regulate, of course, housing associations around their governance and their finances. And, and quite right that we do. Nobody wants an organisation to go belly up. That would have terrible impact on, on tenants and would have terrible impact on the new supply of social housing. So we already regulate on the, on the economic side, as we call it. And we regulate on the consumer side side reactively for both housing associations and local authorities and the way i think of, of of regulating reactively and i have to say i'm new to regulation i only started here six months ago i've got 30 years in the sector but but uh, six months only in regulation so i think of reactive consumer regulation as being where people have to bring problems to us we can't go looking for them people bring problems to us and they have to be at a really high bar that's that serious detriment test they have to be systemic and they have to have potential harm for lots of lots of tenants of course the housing ombudsman operates in the space of individual tenant complaints so there's a lot of players a lot of players um in involved in this culture shift and, and moving the sector on so our transition from reactive to proactive consumer regulation where we can then go looking for problems i think of it in three areas number one will be the revision of consumer standards and they will be very much aligned to as as written in the social housing white paper again we will come out for consultation when we when we amend those and then how we get assurance against them. And I think for this audience, that's particularly interesting, because when I say how we will get assurance against those standards, that means how does it play with our current programme work on economic regulation? How do we involve tenants in that assurance on consumer um, issues? How do we triangulate with information that we're getting from the housing ombudsman and from um, other parts of our work and other parts of the sector? And I think that then starts to develop something more proactive. Now I've left the tenant satisfaction measures to last and there's a reason. Yes, to consultation at the moment. That's the first bit we're doing. We don't need legislation for it. So that's why it's, it's first. And you will also need a couple of years of lead in. When we publish what we're going to do with those tenant satisfaction measures, landlords will need to set up the systems and then get a whole year of data. So that's why we need a long lead in. Now, the tenant satisfaction measures are a set of what you will know as involved tenants as key performance indicators, means that you can have a look at how your landlord is performing and perhaps benchmark with other, with other landlords. They'll cover a whole range of, of areas, again, as in the, in the social housing white paper, things like how do landlords keep properties in good repair? How do they maintain building uh, safety, effective handling of complaints, respectful and helpful tenant in engagement? And when you see the consultation, which by the way, closes on the 3rd of March, you will see that it covers off um, those areas. It's still a very open consultation. We want to hear people's views. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say about the tenant satisfaction measures. I think they're really important as a can opener. They're important for, as a can opener for you to scrutinize your landlord's performance. They're important as a can for us, the regulator, to look at performance. But I'm really glad there is going to be much more to proactive consumer regulation than a set of performance indicators, because you need to understand the context around it. There are, if you looked at a set of indicators, it won't necessarily 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 tell you the geography that people are operating in the type of organization it is housing associations alone there's over a thousand active ones in england that's before we even get to local authorities and you have to look at a lot of wider context beyond just some um, performance measures nevertheless 
a useful can opener. And we've worked with a number of bodies, including Tarot. We're really grateful for Tarot being on the sounding board to helping us develop these. And we've worked with tenants as well. We've worked informally um, and now we're, we're seeking your views formally through consultation. A couple of things that tenants have told us when we have been out engaging informally, and none of this will be a surprise to you. Tenants have said to us, look, we're worried that with key performance indicators, landlords could game these or they could present something that's going really well over here when something quite awful is going on over there. And that speaks to this point about needing a much wider context around them than just a set of numbers as helpful as they are in themselves. The other things that, that tenants have said to us is, please, 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 can we just have clear communication? And that's a message to us for their, for their landlords. Um, universally good communication is so important and we hear it all the time. The other thing I would say that we hear from and I know this myself from having been in the sector for 30 years, blimey, if Bill Clinton had a message on his office that said it's the economy stupid, then landlords should have a sign that says it's repair stupid, because the, 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 the distance you can go in just getting an effective repair service right will actually deal with quite a bit of this. So those are some really important messages that, that tenants have told us. Now, we are the regulator and uh, the way we operate is set by government and much of that won't change just because we have proactive consumer regulation. So love it or loathe it, our relationship with will primarily be still with landlords. It won't be directly with tenants, although we'll be working on how we get tenants tenant input to our uh, assurance on the consumer standards. So we call it co-regulatory, an approach which is the primary relationship is between landlord and tenant. So what we don't do is tell landlords exactly how to do these things. They are for boards, local councillors, involved tenants like yourselves to understand the sort of idiosyncrasies of your own organisations and set those yourself. We focus on the outcomes. So what is the service like? What's the quality of homes like? What's the satisfaction like? And although we haven't got the legislation yet, we're doing an awful lot of speaking engagements at the moment like this with groups of tenants and with landlords and with boards and with local authorities. And we're saying some really consistent things. Number one, don't wait for the legislation. Get on and do this now. A lot of this is not rocket science. It's about clear and transparent communication. It's about involving tenants in the things that are important to them, in the services that are important to them. And it's about delivering effective, really good customer and um, repair services. And that means for boards and local councillors, really understanding who their tenants are, what their, what their homes are, what's the quality of their homes, are there patterns that are coming back up the business that are telling you that there are problems with particular types of homes or in a particular type of area, are there patterns from your complaints data that's telling you that maybe tenants with a vulnerability or tenants who don't speak English as a first language are having difficulty getting through your systems, in which case set yourself an action plan and do something about it. So we're saying don't wait and get on with this. But it will take us a couple of years now to develop, once we get the legislation, the final piece, the final package. And I think just before I run out of time and get, get kicked off, um, just a few really key things that I, that I want to, to share with you. We will come out at every point, at every stage, and work with landlords and tenants to get your feedback. I think that's worked really well so far. Mostly people don't understand what regulators do. We're a bit impenetrable, but I can tell you, I'm so pleased that as of today, the consultation feedback to the tenant satisfaction measures has been 75% from tenants. And that's not just tenants groups, it's individual tenants. And I, you know, I really have to thank groups like Tarot for making that, that possible and really engaging 
tenants on this because we have set ourselves three tests for everything we do. Number one, it's got to make a meaningful difference to tenants. Why on earth would we change the way we're doing things? Why on earth would we change how we look at landlords if it didn't make a meaningful difference to tenants? I go back to the vision of the white paper. This has to improve the sector for tenants. The second thing, it has to be deliverable by landlords. We don't want to create something that's so damn complicated that people don't know from one day to the next what they're supposed to be doing. So we have to be very clear and very precise with the final package. And we can't get sort of knocked off course by a whim or something that we think is interesting and we end up down a rabbit hole. We've got to be really clear and take in the diversity of the sector. And it has to be deliverable by landlords. So we don't want to create something so complicated that it's really expensive and resource heavy because that wouldn't hold, solve the problem. That would take money away from tenant services. So it has to be within those three parameters. Um, and I'm confident that with your help and your engagement, uh, as we've had to date, that we will get something that, that works. And my final point um, before we, we move on to, to, to Sarah and to Darren, I think my final point is the vision of the social housing white paper is so important that it's not just about regulation. A lot of people can't believe I say this, but in five years time, when we have a better sector as a result of this, it won't be because of regulation. If it's because of regulation, we're in a really bad spot. The regulator comes in when things are really, really grim. It will be because of a partnership of yourselves, landlords, towards the housing ombudsman, the building safety regulator, everyone pushing this over the line. Because I said at the start, I think it's overdue. We are due a cultural reset in the sector that puts tenants at the heart of it. So I'll leave it there. I think I'm just about on time and then I'm happy to pick up any questions later. Thank you. Hey, that's perfect, Kate. I mean, we're having um, questions and comments coming in. Um, that is quite interesting. What I'm gonna do, is move on to Sarah first. We're gonna hear from the speakers first. I am keeping an eye on the chat. The chat is also gonna be saved. So we will have a copy of the chat after and any questions and comments um, uh, that are not answered in this session, we will um, attempt to follow up. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce Sarah Davis, who is the um, Senior Policy and Practice Officer at CIH. And she is going to do a 10 minute um, on what CIH is doing to help form this consultation. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm just gonna try and share my screen. So bear with me a minute or two, and hopefully I will be able to um, Okay, I'm hoping you can see that. That sounds a bit ominous. Do people, can people see? Okay, hi, Sarah. It's saying that you were started sharing a screen, but it's a black screen at the moment. Okay, right. So oh, now, now, yeah, now we can see it, great. Now Brilliant. we can see it, okay, no, that's great, that's great. So let me see if I can then do the, um, do the slideshow. And we, and we can just say that these slides will be available after, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, brilliant. Excellent, so I'm going to um, rattle through and some of it will kind of echo um, Kate's points, but thank you very much for inviting me to take part uh, today. And really important for CIH to be in a, um, an arena where we can hear tenants' voices as well. Because as you know, the Chartered Institute is the professional body for people working in housing. So our members work in housing associations and local authorities, but we are very much focused around the housing professional's role is about delivering good services, good communities and supporting. And so for us, that, that cultural reset that, that Kate was talking about is really valuable and important and one that we support. So, you know, just as Kate said, it starts with the charter for social housing and, um, and from our perspective, again, yes, this, this provided a, a really good 
challenge to the sector to, to set its services and, and its vision around tenants, around keeping tenants safe, around ensuring that properties and homes and communities were um, vibrant, uh, healthy, well-maintained, and to actually deliver good services and respond properly to tenants. So the charter set out the kind of five key areas where, um, and the TSMs are built around that. But more broadly, um, it is about getting that reset around tenants and residents. And I'd agree with Kate that actually in a lot of our discussions with housing professionals, this has been really welcomed and not nobody's really pushing against it. It's a question of how we refine it and make sure it really works to deliver that meaningful engagement. Um, and as Kate has said, this, the TSM, this current consultation that we're focused on, is only one element within that wider consumer regulation to come. Um, but it is what we can do now. And I have to say, it's really extensive. It's, it, it's quite challenging. There's a lot of material there because there's, a, there's quite, the white paper also gave quite a direction of travel for the regulator and the sector. Um, so it's actually got to balance a lot of what's already been set for it and how it makes that operational, deliverable and meaningful for the regulator, for tenants, for the landlords to actually make sure they are um, looking at those services proactively. So there's a lot there. Um, a really helpful timetable. The lead in, as Kate said, has got to be quite long because some organisations will possibly have to do a bit more um, trouble to get to, to where the regulator will want them to be on collecting and reporting on things. So there's the, the, um, the, the paper for the consultation itself, it's quite extensive. If it would be helpful or people would think it would be useful, I've done a quick summary. Quick summary, I have to say, is still 17 pages, but be happy to share it if people feel that's valuable. Um, so focusing on the TSMs, bearing in mind Kate's point, very valid point about this being a small part of the big picture of it providing a source of information and a can opener to look at your landlord and to see what they're doing and to, to think about how they could improve. Um, what the TSMs are trying to achieve is to get that balance between data that is clear, transparent, and also comparable, so you can use it to think about your landlord services and challenge them about where they're coming from on it, but also balanced with that flexibility for organisations to develop their way forward with their tenants um, and for the, uh, for the regulator not to be uh, prescriptive, but actually, you know, make sure that that is being taken forward primarily between the landlord and the tenants. So it's a balancing act so that you can see that the regulator is trying to achieve through the TSMs. But it is about providing a source of useful information. And, and again, it's got to, to meet several audiences. So yourselves as tenants, communities that might, you know, particularly where several landlords are operating in a similar space and for the regulator themselves and, and providing that kind of can opener within the wider sort of consumer regulation. So it's actually got to try and do quite a lot. So it, it's that continual balancing act. And I think what's really valuable uh, in terms of your voice in the feedback is whether you feel that balance will work for you as tenants. Bearing in mind that obviously probably where you might want a lot more information is at your local level, whereas obviously the TSMs are, are, are um, being collected at this level. But they're done, that flexibility should mean that your landlords can make them granular to where you want to be if that's appropriate for them and you as well. So I've just captured the overall headlines of the, of the TSMs around those five key areas. Um, just in case it's useful for you to have these with your slides to see. Um, the ones in blue are the ones that will be delivered through the tenant perception survey. And again, because of trying to get that clear and comparable data, um, the regulators had to be fairly prescriptive in terms of what the questions should be, whilst giving trying to give landlords flexibility on how they might collect your perceptions of their services. So, um, you, so some of the wording will have to be quite precise, but you know how they might actually ask for your opinion might vary 
you know, whether it's online or face to face. And there are questions where that's that's a bit of the balance. Will that work? Have we got the have we struck the right um, kind of balance there to actually give you that assurance and give the regulator that assurance? So I would say, and I'll just move on to the next one as well. So those are the, the headline TSMs. I would say again, in some of the discussions we've had, and obviously for CIH, our, our discussions are with housing professionals largely in organizations. Um, we haven't had any pushback on this. I would agree with Kate that actually people are really um, proactive and positive about this. Some of the issues coming up maybe are really granular about where that balance has come and is it struck in the right and will the way the questions, particularly around the tenant perception survey rather than performance management, will that um, really, really gather meaningful data? So some of that is relating to the, the scope of, of, of um, people's experience of tenant services. So you can imagine that the questions about repairs will, will garner quite a lot of um, exper experience that tenants have had in engaging with their, their landlord about repairs, you know, how it was to report it, what, what, what the timeliness was of it, etc. So a lot will have experience of that. But in some measures, such as antisocial behaviour, or even perhaps in complaints, you know, um, is this the best way to target and get meaningful information? Because hopefully the majority of tenants maybe won't have had to complain or won't have experienced ASB. So actually, is this the best way to try and get some of that meaningful behaviour or does it risk diluting it? So those are some of the comments we've had coming back. So to reassure you that I think housing professionals and landlords are really positive about this. What it is is actually how we how we maximise the benefits for you. Because there's quite a lot of really detailed questions, what I think is really useful for, for you as as, as tenants and, and also actually for some of our members, we're saying, you know, if you're involved in, in this a lot to the detail, you'll be you'll be looking at the detail, but there are some broad ways you can look at actually, let me think about this, what does it achieve? So is it actually achieving your priorities? Hopefully it will be because the white paper itself was informed by a lot of engagement with tenants by the government, but is it covering and capturing your priorities? Do you think the way it's set will provide you with that assurance about what your landlord's really doing? And do you think it will reflect the right picture back to the regulator? Are we, you know, looking at too many areas um, in feedback or too few? And are there some that really, really matter for you? The, you know, the crunch issues uh, that you really want the regulator and your landlord to concentrate on and improve? Are there any that are too hard to measure? We are getting some feedback that's for some, perhaps around neighborhood contribution, where the landlord is only one of a number of agencies. Can we make them meaningful in terms of understanding what your landlord is doing around that? And are there any that aren't, 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 aren't really of value and, uh, in terms of your importance? And I suppose the other issue is how, how, how are we to do this so that we can get the right balance between data and information for the regulator and yourself that is really transparent and clear and helps you compare perhaps with other landlords or maybe to see the ongoing progress your own landlord is making. You know, perhaps the comparison for you is actually let's set a baseline and see how we improve. Um, or would more direction be helpful, you know, around the methodology to try and get that balance right between it really being comparable. Um, because sometimes the way we do uh, things can actually affect how, how um, you know, the kind of quality and the, the range of information we get back. So I think those are some useful headlines, maybe for you to think about um, what you want to say to, to the regulator um, and how to say it. So in, in summing up, I'd say, do make your voice heard. Fantastic that the, the feedback to date the regulator's getting is predominantly from uh, tenants. Let's, let's make sure that your voices are heard on this. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that through your di more direct responses to the, the regulator in its consultation through TARO, uh, obviously with events like today. Uh, for, if you're um, active landlords with uh, active with your landlords through your landlord as well, hopefully they are actually talking to you about, about this and getting your views as well as the organization's views and staff. 
through CIH happy if you want to drop me a line as well. So I've left my um, my information there because whilst we're the body for housing professionals, you know, at, some of our members are also tenants as well as professionals in the sector. Um, but also our concern is actually how housing professionals deliver good services. So it, it, we're happy to hear from you as well. And just to reiterate, which Kate has already mentioned that the closing date is the 3rd of March. So um, it just to focus our minds on getting getting some of our voices through. So I hope that's been a useful look in, in a slightly bit more detail around the TSMs, but um, happy to take questions um, afterwards. Uh, I hope I've come in on time for you as well, Leslie. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. That was like a whistle stop tour. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, and everyone will see the slides after. So finally, we're going to hear from Darren. There is some um, great activity in the chat and we will be getting to those conversations after this. Keep them coming because I am um, reading them as uh, people are speaking and making note. Um, so I'm going to introduce Tar um, Darren Hartley is the chief exec of Tarot Trust and he's going to talk um, about this issue um, from Tara's perspective um, and how we see things. Um, go ahead, Darren. Thank you. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, no slides from me. I'm just going to talk it through. Um, uh, and and I, I should probably start from the perspective that yeah, I, I guess anything that I say is, is just our initial uh, perspectives. Uh, we're very much in, in listening mode at the moment. The consultation phase, as we've heard from, from others today, um, is live. Uh, we have been receiving emails um, from, um, from, from tenants uh, to say, give us a kind of an indication of what their views and feelings are. Uh, we, we've got today, and um, that's really valuable as well in terms of that. Uh, if after today's event, you want to send your your uh, thoughts and views uh, to us directly to inform our collective Tower of Trust response, then please do so. Uh, I'd request if, if it was sent to us uh, ideally by about the 20th of, of this month, um, that would give us time to kind of digest and assimilate the views, uh, to have our trustee meeting uh, and then, and, and then finalise our, our response as, as well um, on that. Um, so I'm just going to. So so yeah, um, so yeah, we're we're live, uh, and it's going to be subject to 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 further feedback. Initial thoughts and views um, is that overall it's a it's a welcome development. If we were to kind of look back three or four years, uh, certainly pre Grenfell, with the focus that was had on economic matters. The very prospect or thought of having a discussion around tenant satisfaction measures as part of the regulatory environment, I think, would, would have been anathema. Uh, so, so great to, to, to see that there is kind of increased focus in, the, in, this, in this area. Uh, obviously, it's on the back of the, 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 the white paper. Um, and, and I guess it's probably worthwhile saying that that white paper now is November 2020 and, and some initial sort of feedback that we're increasingly hearing now is, is that things just take a very long time. They do take a very long time. And I guess the messages that we've been saying is that um, many landlords shouldn't wait uh, until um, all of the, the, the structures are put in place and that, that there's no reason why landlords shouldn't be uh, acknowledging and taking forward the, um, and, and listening to tenants now as part of the the very important cultural changes that need to that need to take place. Um, something that we often refer to as tenant primacy. That, that, um, so, and, and let's not forget we we are starting from a fairly low uh, base here. Uh, we've seen uh, quite a number of exposures in in the national press on TV uh, about just the trust and confidence that a lot of tenants have. So there's a long journey that we've got to got to follow. Um, moving it kind of slightly more specifically to, to the consultation, uh, obviously um, this is a really difficult balance. There are a lot of uh, technical supporting information as part of the consultation. Uh, and you could say, oh, well, do we need all of this information? I guess the, the flip side to that is, is that at least the regulator is being uh, forward and upfront and in it explaining uh, and being quite 
prescriptive in the methodology that, that landlords will need to follow to try and give a degree of comparability and to combat some of the issues which are again and again to sort of the concerns that tenants tell us about is about this gaming of the system about uh, influencing so so i guess a number of those kind of prescriptive methodologies are designed to to temper um those um the, the the ability to be able to skew those results uh, um but i think even so the fact that there will be flexibility in the methodology will allow for landlords to still uh, decide whether they do face-to-face -face interviews or whether it's over the telephone or whether it's postal votes and we know that there are differences amongst different methodologies adopted and the results that are, are obtained i do note from the consultation that within the it does state that landlords are also going to need to say about what methodologies they followed and to give a breakdown of, of, of how that fits so there'll be some some ability to compare um, the results and I should probably say then that this is again the regulators kind of the damned if they do and they're damned if they don't aren't they on, on moving forward with tenant satisfaction measures uh, there's a risk that we get to overly hung up with tenant satisfaction measures as just one aspect of a much broader picture. Of course, what they've done is they've been able to move forward. They've moved forward on what they are able to move forward with. Um, there's a kind of a second other question there, isn't there, about well, what are the broader changes to proactive consumer regulation that we need uh, to see? Um, because obviously, um, they've had to operate with this very high threshold at the moment on the consumer side and uh, I, those that have heard me talk in the past is very much like operating with one arm tied behind your back that you can only um, that they can proactively regulate economic issues and to date have, have, have been had to be very reactive um, unless that that very high serious detriment threshold has been breached. And we know from the white paper that it's proposed that that will be removed, but if it's removed, that means that there's gonna be a review of the wider standards. And that might mean that there needs to be a review of some of the, the tenant satisfaction measures as, as we move forward, because there are new things um, to, to be introduced um, uh, within those. So I guess the summary to that is there are some timing distortions that I guess we're being asked to just kind of live with so that some progress can can be made. Um, um, the questions themselves, um, many of the questions, and I know from the, our participation in the working group, I've described as, as kind of tried and tested in that if you if your own landlord already uses kind of tenant perception based um, um, questions, a lot of them might look familiar, the wording's quite similar. I guess the, kind of the flip side to that is, but are there areas which you would really wish to see questions asked about, uh, which are completely missing? So they might be tried and tested, but it might not cover the things which um, you think are, are, are important to be able to kind of hold your landlord to account. And I'll come back to that again in, in, in a few moments time. Um, um, Terminology, um, it's all kind of wrapped up under tenant satisfaction measures. And there are a number of tenant perception based questions. Are you satisfied with X or Y or that kind of question? But there are a number of things which are just kind of performance metrics, so compliance with decent home standards, for instance, and percentage of repairs completed and, and things. And, and I, I think perhaps they're perhaps better described as performance metrics. Um, alongside tenant satisfaction metrics, as opposed to kind of lumping them all under tenant satisfaction, which some of them are, are, are not so much. Um, I've, I've had a few emails as well, and I know that there are some particular challenges for small, small housing providers and that there's some flexibility given in the, in the, in the, in the methodology for, for smalls. I guess the, the point that I would want to, to say is that shouldn't mean that if you're a tenant of a small landlord that you are kind of there's a two tier system and that you're no less uh, entitled to high quality services than being a tenant of a large landlord. And I think that that should be kind of the, 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 the starting point for for regardless of size, you, you, you shouldn't be expect um, lower levels of, of, of service. Um, 
Looking more at some of the questions, some of the initial early questions talks about the proposed new standard for um, the kind of tenant satisfaction measures standard, quite a mouthful. Um, but, and it says about enabling effective scrutiny by, by tenants. And I, I, I think I'd probably raise the question at this point as to whether that goes far enough. Um, yes, enabling effective scrutiny by tenants, but um, should, that, should that be enabling for effective scrutiny by the regulator, by other stakeholders, by the local authority? And is it just about scrutiny? Is it about um, beyond scrutiny, the kind of that accountability? Is it about opportunities for, for, for engage, engagement as well? Would be one of my, would be one of my questions. Um, I think on some of the other questions, they may require some, some for, for them to, to kind of be understandable and to elicit responses which are consistent. There might need to be additional explanations um, when they're being asked about what we mean by, say, antisocial behaviour or a complaint as opposed to a request for a service. What you mean by the neighbourhood? Does the neighbourhood need just if you're in a communal block, just that communal block, or is it the wider area outside? Um, and then on, on the tenant satisfaction specific for involvement and engagement questions, um, I, th I think there might be some, some gaps there. It's good that they've got some questions in that area, but what about um, an additional question around satisfaction that the landlord provides opportunities to be involved in landlord decision making and not just in any landlord not the decision making on what the landlord thinks might be important to you but on matters um, or issues that are important to you as a tenant so we know at the moment even under the existing tenant involvement and empowerment standard that there's an obligation for for landlords to engage tenants with that decision making um, so shouldn't we be asking questions as to whether tenants feel that, that those opportunities are being are actually being provided. Um, a couple of other miscellaneous points, uh, group structures. The proposal is for reporting on a group structure basis. Um, I guess I'd raise the question as to whether there's opportunities, particularly from a, uh, for a, um, a group structure that has a number of housing associations, um, and especially where there's been kind of mergers of different housing associations that have still maintain a certain identity, whether there's room for, for reporting of, of metrics for individual housing association on an individual housing association basis, where that might be a subsidiary of a, of a group to get you, because there's the risk, the, the risk there being that if you're part of a very large group and tenants are very happy in other uh, housing associations within the group that that could distort or mean that those voices are are, are not being being heard. Um, other gap obvious gaps shareholders. Um, there's nothing within the the consultation around kind of wider members or shareholders. Um, and we we put in our manifesto for change more generally that we think that there are opportunities through shareholding for greater levels of accountability um, to be introduced through that. Um, if anybody's involved in tenant management organisations, there, there looks to be to be to be gaps there um, as well. And then I suppose the the, the final area uh, where there might require some so a lot of this is kind of reliant on the lines of communication between the landlord and the tenant. But if the landlord isn't kind of playing as part of that game, what other options are there? For, for, for going back to the, to, um, the regulator for collective tenant voices uh, through say tenants associations, TARAs, uh, regional or even national um, organizations like our, ourselves as, as well, to be able to get those voices heard more, more, more generally. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna hand back to, to Leslie, but hopefully that's given some food for thought on, on kind of key areas that, that might be important to you as we kind of move into the, the chat in the second half of, of today's, today's web, 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 webinar. Thank you, Darren.
I think that just rounded everything off really completely. I've just been um, reading the chat. Brian is absolutely on fire today. Um, one of the questions I wanted to pick up for the panel um, is um, there was talk today, Kate, about um, moving the regulator um, from a reactive to a proactive, and this is you know, around the consumer regulation. Um, what recourse is there? And we just kind of heard from um, uh, how I'm, I'm going to kind of word it. Um, so there's, I'm going to try and put on several things here. So how do you hear from the tenants, from the landlords that are not doing a good job and have kind of skewed the results, but also um, Brian adds, how can a tenant hold a landlord to account, for example, decent home standards, when the landlord fails to tell tenants, tenants what these standards are in relation to their homes? So um, I know that there's the ombudsman for individual complaints, but how um, will the reactive to proactive, I don't know, this is like really at the beginning stages and we're kind of trying to crystal ball gaze at the moment, but um, uh, did that make sense for anyone to kind of jump in, but mainly Kate first, I think. I'm, I'm happy to jump in this and I've been watching the, the traffic There's some brilliant questions and hopefully I can pick up a few of these if you if you'll just give me um, a couple of minutes. Um, very specifically on, on the decent home standards, um, the draft TSMs are about keeping properties in good repair, one of them, and one of them is for homes that don't meet the, the decent home standards. But I think there's a, there's a wider point, and that's about um, for tenants who don't necessarily want to get involved in scrutiny or, or active engagement in, in the landlord, and, and there are the, you know, there are many that, that won't. I think we have to develop a proactive consumer regime that accounts for all tenants. So absolutely, this is about having roots to influence on the things that are important. And, you know, I don't need to tell you, Leslie, what a massive cheerleader I am for, for tenant engagement over the past. I'm also concerned, and, and the regulator is, about, about tenants who maybe have one interaction with that landlord during the year, and that's to report a, a repair or a leak. How do you know, as a landlord or a board, that that's a universally good experience for everybody? And that speaks to a little bit about the preparatory work that we're doing on all our speaking gigs at the moment with, with landlords and boards and saying to boards, at the moment, you probably have a very clear dashboard at your board meetings of your financial information. Absolutely right, so you should. You probably have a very good dashboard about your compliance and health and safety information. Absolutely, and so you should. What is your dashboard that you need to understand the experience of tenants living in your, in your homes or their homes and the experience of their access to services. Because if you don't already have that dashboard, then you need to have now, because you need to be asking questions about what are the themes and patterns in what people are telling you around complaints? How easy is it to access your service? Is Are your systems fit for purpose? There should be things that can filter through. And of course, not we're not saying that every board member or even me or the executive team can go and look inside every single home every single week. This is about filtering up through governance and making consumer issues a, an important part of governance. So I think there's a hell of a lot to unpack there. And I think that there's, there's quite a few questions that are, that are hinting on this. Absolutely important for routes to engagement and as important that those who don't want to be engaged have, have a damn good service. And just, just one final point. Um, I think going back to our sort of co-regulatory principles and the primary relationship being between landlord and tenant, I said earlier, love it or loathe it, we won't tell landlords exactly how to do this. So how landlords organise the scrutiny or how involved tenants organise their scrutiny is, is, is up for the landlord, but we are absolutely focused on the outcomes. And if that doesn't deliver the outcomes, then we will get involved. Um, I'm going to bring Darren in, but I just wanted to have a follow up question with you, Kate, with regards to readdressing the balance of power, because the kind of wording is 
um, the tenants have an obligation. I mean, the the landlord has an obligation, but if if they're kind of limiting what a scrutiny panel or um, uh, a you know their their tenant structures are able to look at, um, how I mean, this is like more of the kind of softer, you know, and this is why you're saying that all things that can be measured. Um, it has to be a huge culture change. And I know that you've had major experience of that in the sector of bringing, you know, and it takes time and it's about readdressing that, that power, because I know that about, you know, a third of the landlords right now are doing it and doing it really, really well. Um, you know, and there is the best practice. Others are just kind of doing tick box and others are just absolutely not doing it at all. So it's about, you know, getting this huge culture shift. And so, um, I guess my question is about readdressing that balance of power um, within your 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 remit to encourage, like a more like a carrot as opposed to a regulatory stick to kind of move that. And I think that that's really interesting. It's a, it's it's a, a about this this culture shift, and it speaks to the point earlier that if if we rely on regulation alone to get this over the line, then we're not in the right place. It has to be around the culture of the, of the organization. And the, and the white paper had a, a range of proposals. Some of it was around access to information. And there's a whole a range of stuff to come through legislation that isn't just about our areas of, of proactive regulation. But I think, you know, if I was if I had my old hat on now and I was leading a housing association back in the, the, the sort of environment we're in now, I would see that there is an avalanche of culture change coming, not just regulation, but it is really clear that those routes to engagement need to be wide open and people need to be listening to to tenants in order to deliver the outcomes that we're expecting through regulation. So what I wouldn't want is for people to go away thinking it's proactive regulation that's going to win all of this because it isn't it's a much wider culture shift and the and the, the canny landlords the canny involved tenants the ones who get this are the ones that have got the roots wide open and are listening to tenants at the moment others need to need to follow and step up and that's part of our, our sort of don't wait message so I think that it's part of something wider, Leslie, really. And, and the wise ones will be sort of getting jiggy with this now if they haven't already. But it is part of a, a wider shift where tenants are, are at the heart of, of, of the, the whole sector. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to bring Darren in because he's wanted to share. OK, thanks. Darren. Yeah, thank, thanks, Leslie. I mean, there's so many things to, to kind of unpick here. And um, the, it's almost like it's the same. You can kind of package it and unpackage it and look at it in different ways it's the uh, often the, it kind of flows from the same thing um I, in many ways I, I suppose there's an existential question isn't there about what to what extent can the role of the regulator fulfill and push cultural change towards um placing tenants at the center versus the regulator being part of a broader system. And actually, I, I think what, what, what Kate was saying there is if culture change is ultimately to happen, it's about the individual hearts and minds of organizations taking on the culture change in, and recognizing, accepting, valuing, and then promoting the importance of, of tenant primacy, which is what we often talk about in, in these discussions. And, if you go back to kind of the original model of co-regulation, the CAVE review, one of the one of the areas which was highlighted there is that the very the very existence or need for a regulator is because in many at times co-regulation may work, but actually there are other times when it really won't. So I guess there's a there's a kind of a question that we need to be mindful of there as we move forward in the kind of implementation of the wider white white paper is that we have to make sure that there are very clear messages that that, that the importance of delivering high quality services to tenants is incumbent on the landlord to make sure that that happens but that if it falls down uh, that the 
there will be steps and there will be consequences to those steps. But that it's the right thing to do regardless of those hearts and minds. And that's going to take a number of years in order to be able to kind of move down that journey. Tenant satisfaction measures are a very, very small aspect, but which give a kind of a little insight as, as to part of that. I think more fundamentally, there's going to be the, the review of the consumer standards, which are coming down the line, where that will establish the framework within which tenants have the option. But I think more, more generally than that, there's only so far that the regulator is going to be able to go in, in, this, in this ballpark. But there are kind of wider policy issues that we need to make sure happen. Um, and, and some of those wider policy issues are making sure that tenants have other opportunities to be able to, to, to raise and to have the collective voices, voices heard um, locally, regionally, nationally. I think that that's an important part of the kind of mix which is, which is, being, which is being missed at, at, at the moment with it, within those um, within the structures which are being proposed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause, but I'm very happy to go on to some of the more specific questions if you want if you want me to do so, but I, I won't talk for too long just in case you wanted to kind of break break me up there, Leslie. Okay, thank you, Darren. Um, did you want to say anything, Sarah? I'm just really reading the, um, the chat and, you know, I have to say, um, I'm a big fan of Kate because when I was at uni, at University of Westminster, my dissertational supervisor led on the research of that satisfaction, um, uh, scrutiny satisfaction um, thing with um, the MHC or the DCLG at the time. Um, and it was a really valuable report on, um, you know, the shift in culture and the culture change and having it as the golden thread throughout the organization. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really key that it has it has been done. It does take a while to shift the culture um, and get people on board. And when I was interviewing the, the then chief exec of Amicus Horizon, I said, you know, so what happened to the people? Because there's always people in an organization that absolutely hate change, hate to, you know, are kind of um, aggravated by it. And I said, you know, so what is... You know what's happened to those people and he said they no longer work here so it has to be that golden thread and everyone has to get on board but it does take change so um sarah did you want to come in yeah i i was just going to say with another hat i'm a, a trustee and i think um i think there's a there's it the the key role of communication i think is very hard to grasp in any time kind of way that you'd measure within sort of these satisfaction measures but it can't be you can't downplay actually how critical that is. And I noticed that a few things have come up around information and, you know, obviously that whole kind of like knowledge is power element. So I think, I think one of the things in terms of that achieving that culture change is how you, how, which is beyond, and it comes back to Kate saying regulation is not going to do it, but it's actually fundamentally, I wonder whether there's some way we can try and drive that kind of communication with residents and that kind of habit of listening and responding to and acting on and I know that's part of the question that comes in in the respectful engagement question but for me there's something quite pivotal about you know equipping residents with the information they need to really make sense of this um, and, and use it as one of the levers for them um, so I think I think that's one thing the other thing is culture change has to come in at lots of different uh, lots of different ways doesn't it and it's actually the whole framework that can help an organization make that shift so for example there's the issue around for, for CIH that our professionalism standards for housing professionals that we think needs to play a part in that and that that's recently been reviewed there's there is the TS there's the TSM there's the wider uh, consumer regulation there's how we actually focus on what's good practice and continuous improvement. So I think there are lots of threads we need to pull together. Um, I, but, you know, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, how can we make sure that communication has that primacy and listening to and making sure that there's not the gatekeeping of information, that, it, that we actually are doing that equipping so that, you know, we really can be challenged by our residents. Just a thought, we're not, not an answer. No, no, and I think also, Sarah, that the work you're doing with, you know, addressing, you know, addressing stigma, you know, I was involved in the um, Benefit Society campaign originally. Um, 
you know, addressing stigma, you know, internally within the sector and also externally um, also helps with that um, culture shift. Because I know sometimes internally, you know, there's the attitude of people should just be grateful they have a house and just be quiet, you know. And I think, you know, being able to address that internally through a professional organization like yourself is really powerful, as well as, you know, the tenants um, continuing on with that with that piece of work. So, um, and that's just continuing on with CIH, correct? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, stigma remains one of our um, critical issues that we take forward and, and it, we've tried to embed it in our professional standards framework as well. Yeah. I, mean, I would like, cause I'm, I'm a big um, kind of, um, kind of passionate about quality, diversity, inclusion. And I would love to see it as um, on, you know, quality, impact assessments how have you considered mm -hmm. you know I'm that's where I'm kind of coming from you know I deliver training on equality diversity and the equality act too so that you know so Darren you have a your hand up yeah I was just kind of I didn't want us to miss some of the some of the chat that had gone gone on where we, we said about uh, I think Deb C, Deb C had put in there about a near miss approach and and I, I guess that alludes to a more kind of learning um, base culture um, and also alludes to the kind of the shift in the thresholds because at the moment it's a kind of unless things are really really severe then they're not um, I, I guess that I've got a question for Kate it, 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 which, which kind of follows that th through um, but we'll say a little bit beforehand and that's just that um, in the past, if, if, if you were a little bit unhappy with the, but it, it wasn't a kind of a personal issue that you were taking by a complaint process to the housing ombudsman, but didn't think that the standards were great, but they weren't that bad either, and certainly didn't for the serious detriment. Um, I think that that kind of just fell outside of the powers of the, of, of, of the regulator. We, we don't know exactly but we know from the white paper that 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 threshold is proposed to be removed um, and that a new set of standards are going to be put in place i i guess that leaves the question that there's probably going to be um have to be mechanisms to kind of gather that lower level information at what point does it trigger kind of a question about systemic change at what point the regulator will have to step in at an earlier phase. Um, and tenant satisfaction measures, I guess, will be one part of the decision-making matrix, but will only be a bit of it because there's going to be other aspects. I didn't know whether, and Kate might not be able to say too much because it's pen, going to be pending legislation and I get, get all of that. But I, if there was any sort of like early views on, on um, is that, are we right to understand that the, if the threshold change, what kind of information you collect and then your decision making around that is going to have to change in the future as well. Is that, is that right, Kate? Thanks, Darren. And I'm glad you went back to that question because I'd written it down about that, that sort of near miss health and safety culture, because I thought that was really interesting. And you're, you're right in that the tenant satisfaction measures, let's get that consultation done, it's quantitative, it's, it, you know, that, that's reasonably straightforward, says she, not having to work through hundreds and hundreds of different views. But the next bit is around the consumer standards and then the assurance. Now, this is really early days, but there's a couple of things that I can say in our thinking about how we might develop that. First of all, another one of the messages that we're giving out to, to people is how do boards, local councillors, um, teams satisfy themselves via evidence that they're getting assurance that, that things are right, not reassurance. That there's a big difference between reassurance and assurance. And for us, we, we expect that quite a lot of this work will be through programmed work you know a bit like we do our in-depth assessments at, at the moment a lot of this will be a regular uh, piece of programmed work with with landlords now when we turn up that would that would mean who do we talk to how do we involve tenants in that process what information are we looking at beforehand at the moment our in-depth 
disbursements, you tend to talk to the chair of the board, the chair of the risk and audit committee. Well, who else do we need to talk to to give assurance on, on the consumer side? And what work do we do beforehand in preparation? What's the kind of information that we look at? And this speaks to the near missed bit, because I was going to jump in and say, we will be looking on a, on a regular basis at a range of data. There's the tenant satisfaction measures. There's the, what's the threshold where the housing ombudsman jumps over the fence and goes, there's something you need to look at here. Where do we, where do we share our information at that point? Where do we share information internally with our own colleagues who are doing work on, on governance and on the economic side? If you look at our annual review of consumer regulation, most things lead to poor governance if they're wrong. And I would imagine that there is a big overlap with poor consumer service with poor governance. So there's a whole range of information that we'll, we'll need to look at. I think the other bit that you allude to is, OK, that, that's fine, but what about if things fall outside of programmed work? What if there's a massive red flashing light above, above a landlord and there's something that needs to be done reactively? And all of these things are, are yet to be worked out. So that's kind of as much as I can, can say on the thinking. Don't go away thinking, well, they haven't thought about it, have they? But people tend to hang on every word of the, of the regulator and go, this is it, this is what they're going to be doing there is much more time to develop this and we'll be coming out to consult but i hope i've given you a bit of a flavor of the thinking that it won't suddenly be oh let's go to this landlord completely blind we don't know anything we'll have had ways of taking the temperature and we will take the temperature when we're there so i hope that's a that's a bit of a teaser of some brilliant of that's going to come out this thank year thank you Kate. i know darren wants to jump in regarding governance so come on darren yeah, yeah, just, just. I think that's a really good point that you said about the overlap with governance um, uh, on the economic side of, the, of regulation. That there's often, and 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 we talked earlier about about culture. Um, I I know that the regulator, because they don't, they're concerned with outcomes, are not going to prescribe um, the kind of the makeup of boards. But I guess there is a question there for for consideration that if we think back to say. Um, from a risk management perspective on the global financial crisis, we know that one of the things which people said was this, that if you all come from a similar background with a similar approach to risk and you all have certain sort of values and cultures, that you might, that there's a good chance that you're going to come to the same view on your risk perspective uh, and that, i.e., everything's going to just follow on, go along swimmingly, and there won't be a problem until there was a problem and we had the global financial crash in, what, 2007, 2008. In, in some respects, the diversity of the board and the experience and lived experience is going to be important in being able to be um, in tune with the views and experiences of tenants of living within the, 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 the homes and the neighbourhoods that landlords are delivering their services. Um, and I know that there's kind of lots of sort of double-edged sword effects of being a board member, but, but certainly there are there has been a movement away from tenants being on board. And I suppose there might be just the question there without being prescriptive on the, as to whether there might be some benefits to be derived from having increased diversity on boards so that there is greater levels of, of lived experiences of, of, of serv services within this sector and that there is a richer makeup of an, uh, and a broader diversity of views that are going into the strategic decision making of, 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 of organisations and hopefully then using tier 10 satisfaction measures and all of the other intelligence about service performance to inform future future decision making. Have I got one minute to, to come back on that? Because I think that's really, really helpful. And I think you know, th there's a lot of people that would like to see us have regulatory powers on all sorts of things. You know, one of those being around diversity of boards, both ethnicity and uh, around tenants on boards. We don't have those powers. However, 
there is quite a lot that you can do around soft influencing. And in, in, in parallel with the revised code of governance from the NHF, which is beefed up um, for, for, for this year, in parallel with that, if there are particular problems in a provider that speak to that need for diversity, then it's a legitimate question. Uh, we don't have the powers, but we can, we can move things forward a little bit through those soft influencing and, and, and questions we ask and I think that's a that's a really interesting point that is brilliant um we do have um a few minutes left but I wanted to um I'm still I'm like obsessed with reading the chat what we are going to do because this has been a very you, everyone is so knowledgeable and we will print out the chat and any questions um and themes that haven't been answered in today's session will be forwarded to the speakers and hopefully um, we'll um, come back. Um, there is someone that has, um, Brian, I, I, sorry, I couldn't see because I've got everything open. So Brian has his hand up. Um, did you want to come in, Brian, very quickly before I make the closing um, remarks? Oh yeah, the, the, there you are, thank you. Uh, it's just the, the, the whole concept of board members, a tenant board member is, is, has to, uh, at the moment, be loyal to the company and to back up the company. They don't have the freedom as they used to have with when they were volunteers. They are, they're paid members of the board. Their loyalty is to the board, not to the tenants. And they... When they may bring ideas, uh, the, the, the whole loyalty thing is to the board, it's not to the tenants, and they are restricted in that. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah, can, can, can I just clear? Uh, absolutely, there's no, this is not a kind of a golden ticket to suggest that this is going to um, resolve all of the issues. And there is as many downsides. I did, I think I, I, I highlighted that, that it's a double edged sword. It, so there are many downsides to 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 or restrictions for tenants being board members. It was just one suggestion as about kind of the diversity of the the, the board membership, um, and that there's a lot of other changes that will need to be necessary for for tenants to be able to have an influence and 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 to have proper accountability. And it's sometimes the case that you can be much more challenging if you're outside than than to be on there. And I get that. I get that point very much so so thanks for that brian um, and thank you darren and just reading sandy's comment i totally agree with brian it's amazing how many vocal tenants suddenly are asked to become a board member one reason i will never be one more effective outside of the board so that is exactly the point so i just wanted to because i'm very conscious of time thank everyone for coming today it's been a really lively discussion i'm hoping kate we can invite you back um, at certain points in, you know, once this consultation has closed, did you just want to kind of go over the timeline? So these, I think you, you said it really succinctly the other day, just the expected timeline. Um, yeah, sure. So, so working for the, the consultation ends the 3rd of March. Did I say that already? Please get your consultation responses in the 3rd of March. We will cogitate on all the um, responses. Um, and then we will late summer, we will publish our decision statement on how the TSMs are going to work with technical guidance. Providers will prepare their systems, uh, autumn 22 to spring 23, first year of data, April 23 to March 24. And then the providers will submit to us September, summer 24, and then we'll publish autumn 2024. You'll never ask me a question again, will you? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm hoping that we can have you back as other things progress, because this is just one um, aspect of a whole package of things that, that are going to be coming along. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, and we will um, uh, be following up in an email. Everyone will be able to um, see, kind of watch this on playback. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much for coming today and hope to see you the next time. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.